transmission lines actually undergo a lot of design considerations. It is to ensure that it can transmit and carry the maximum amount of power. This is a transmission line. These structures that people complain as ugly and ruins as staticness. But they carry electricity to places you want it to. This is a cross-section of a conductor. There are two main materials used here as the conductor. The outer fibers are of aluminum, designed to conduct electricity and lightweight to reduce sag. And the inner fibers are steel, not really to conduct electricity, but to serve as mechanical strength, to give the aluminum much needed support. And if you notice, the fiber strands are spiral. This is also another design consideration. It is to provide more mechanical strength to support sag more uniformly. Why is sag important? Because sag is what determines transmission line capacity limits. It is not that the conductor is going to melt. It is not that the conductor is going to explode. The conductor is not going to snap or break if you overload it too much. It is not going to catch on fire. Long story short, the answer is sag. Yep, that's it. That's the whole video. For the six kids who are going to sit for your test, which is happening 40 minutes from now, in your answer paper, just write down SAG and you get your full 20 marks. When you're conducting electricity, especially AC electricity, alternating current, not valid for DC current, the electrons tend to run along the edges of the conductors, leaving the center of the conductor practically useless and not conducting much. This is called a skin effect. More electrons on the same area will cause heating quickly and will expand and lead to SAG. This is how much electrons you can carry on a solid cylinder. And this is how much electrons you can carry with fibers. So by chopping up solid cylinder into multiple strands, you have essentially opened more roads and more path for electrons to run along and less congestions. More transmission capacity and less temperature increase. There, master's degree done. We talked about why we designed to avoid or minimize SAG. But why is SAG bad? Nobody likes it saggy, right? Nobody, nobody, has, nobody, nobody, nobody. Well, you will get a different answer if you talk to different people about SAG. If you talk to engineers who work in this line, we don't want the SAG because it's going to break the clearance. That's the keyword, clearance. There you go, another 10 marks. SAG is what determines the limit for transmission line carrying capacity. Transmission lines stay in the air and off the ground for a reason. So nobody touches it or gets near it. In other words, clearance. So what happens to the line when the clearance is breached? Well, electricity finds a path to earth or ground. Specifically, electricity finds a shorter path to ground. That's why they call it short circuit. In other words, a flashover may happen. When a short circuit happens, voltage is not maintained and the protection relay will kick in and trip the circuit. There might also be some fire from the flashover and we don't want that. There is another reason why SAG is bad. The first reason we've mentioned earlier in this video is clearance. There is another reason why the conductors cannot be too hot other than SAG and this is the reason. So this is a regular conductor and this is the conductor when it's hot and saggy. This is a regular conductor at normal conditions. And because of loss of power, the temperature increases. And because the temperature increases, it becomes elongated and saggy. But when it cools down, it returns to the shape and less saggy. It's like a rubber band, stretched and unstretched. So this is all true if the conductor stays below like 75 degrees Celsius. Then the aluminum is able to retain its elasticity behavior when it cools down again, obviously. But if you spend time above the design temperature limit, the aluminum will anneal and it will lose its elasticity property. So the next time the aluminum is heated up and lengthened, it will take less temperature and less sag to breach the clearance because it is already annealed and it doesn't have elasticity anymore. Since you guys stayed on the video for this long, here's a little bonus bit of knowledge. In class, you learn that lines have inductive properties. It also has capacitive properties, but it is well known that the capacitive part comes from the line and the ground resembling a capacitor. But where does the inductive part come from? The inductive part of the line comes from this. Watch carefully. You are about to get your mind blown. The inductive part of the line comes from the conductor fiber strands spinning in spirals. Very much like an inductor coil. Boom. Mic drop. 
All those times when you just accepted the fact that transmission lines are inductive and therefore can omega L is larger than R and impedance Z can be just assumed to be omega L. The L part comes from these spirals. Try asking your professor on where the, this inductive part of the transmission line comes from. I bet they don't even know shit. They may not even know what this image is if your professor has only been inside of a university. Another design consideration is the lightning shield. Depending on which part of the world you are in, there are different standards. This is an isochronic map, basically a map of how often lightning strikes a certain area. Lightning density, if you will. At places where lightning doesn't strike that often, a 30 degree shielding protection may suffice. This is a 30 degree shielding angle. It means that from the top Irving wire where it shields the rest of the conductors, it has a 30 degree protection. But at places where lightning is more dangerous or generous, we have to go stronger on the protection. This is a zero degree protection. Zero degree means that the top wire, the shield wire, has a zero degree relationship with the rest of the conductors. One straight line down. Anything after the zero degree is considered not protected and this is a standard to follow. The next one is the most protective that I've seen. It is called a negative 4 degree protection. And if you observe this picture, there are 12 conductors here, meaning 4 circuits. Negative 4 degree means that the top shielding wire and the relationship with that and the most bottom conductor, because it's the most further away, is hardest to protect, has a negative 4 degree relationship. And the top shielding wire must overcover the bottom conductor from the lightning. It must shield it. Kind of like an umbrella. And if you observe this picture, there are like 12 conductors here, meaning 4 circuits. Red, yellow, blue, red, yellow, blue, red, yellow, blue, red, yellow, blue. Typical transmission towers have the following characteristics. Either 3 lines, or 6 lines, or sometimes 12 lines. This is because we transfer electricity by 3 phases. And so, typically, the number will have a 3 as a factor. Why 3 phase? Go ask Tesla or some shit, man. This, this topic is not covered in this video. One last thing. Overhead exposed conductors, we call them lines. Underground, insulated, and covered conductors, we call them cables. There is a difference. Don't go calling these bare conductors that we see floating around as cables. It is cringy. So, Exposed overhead are called lines. Underground, cables. Cables are insulated with this black stuff. Lines are bare conductors. You're watching the Funsi channel. Do, 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 do.